Hello everyone, this is Sanjay Ranka. I'm a faculty at University of Florida in Gainesville. Um, I work on AI-based applications and today's talk is on edge-based AI for smart transportation. If you need to reach me, you can find both my number and my email uh, right there. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions after the talk. Um, most of my work has been supported by National Science Foundation, and Florida Department of Transportation. And I'd like to thank both the agencies for supporting our work. Our work is focused on using a variety of sensors, as you can see in the middle, video, LIDAR, radar, et cetera, along with AI and machine learning to solve two broad problems in transportation, one for safety and the other one for operations. In particular, we are interested in looking at traffic behavior and pedestrian behavior at intersection to prevent accidents from happening. Uh, there are a lot of deaths in the US every year. We want to be able to see whether we can use these technologies to improve uh, the overall safety. The other thing which we look at is how do you improve network operations so that travel times for all the uh, drivers reduce uh, by what they are today. Um, our work has been driven by applications of interest to transportation professionals. So this is a close collaboration with City of Gainesville and City of Orlando, where we work with uh, these professionals to understand their applications. And then we look at the data which is being collected and we try to fill the gap by developing AI-based algorithms to be able to address that. We collect a lot of data uh, my lab collects of the order of 40 gigabytes of data per day. Some of it is in real time and some of this is offline. It contains a variety of modalities, video, ground sensor, and roadside in the data. Now you may ask, what does it take to develop AI applications for a variety of domains? Um, in particular, transportation, you require some uh, access to transportation infrastructure where you can collect the data, but not only be able to collect the data, but be able to test your new methods to see whether they actually lead to improvements. Uh, clearly, for machine learning algorithms, you need a computational infrastructure consisting of GPUs and large number of CPUs, and also storage. Uh, but beyond that, most AI-based applications, one of the major challenges is that you have very little uh, label data and you need to be able to generate that using simulators. Clearly, these simulators have to be calibrated so that they generate data which is realistic. And, and another important part about simulation is that it can allow you to generate data for counterfactuals, which sometimes may not even exist in the real world, to be able to train your algorithms so that they perform well across a variety of situations. We obviously leverage standard uh, software uh, for machine learning, along with develop our own algorithms for addressing the applications of interest. Um, as I was pointing out earlier, you do need a transportation infrastructure. So we have access to 27 signals around University of Florida along four corridors. We get real-time data from all of them. Uh, along with that, we have 60 OBUs which are in vehicles which interact with these traffic signals and we get data from them too. Uh, we also have data around from eight to 10 uh, video cameras, the shy cameras in particular, which can observe the entire intersections along with a few LIDARs. All of this data comes in to a variety of storage and computation infrastructure. On the top part, you see high bandwidth, low latency applications, where the assumption is that that, that processing and store will be done on the edge, both from a processing point of view, but also from a privacy point of view. And, and then the summary information is sent to the cloud. On the lower part, which you see right there, uh, these applications are low latency um, as well as low bandwidth. They can, these data sets can directly go to the cloud. We use Amazon Cloud for doing most of our processing, although Potentially, this can be replaced by other cloud vendors also. Uh, so let's look at a scenario. You have multiple cameras. 
a fisheye camera, each of them, like this camera one can observe this part of the intersection, camera two can observe this part of the intersection. And our goal has been to develop software using machine learning, which can process these streams and combine them together. So we have developed new algorithms, both from a detection, tracking of different kinds of objects, and then be able to fuse them across these fisheye cameras to be able to create a UI which the traffic engineers can have a look at on a particular intersection. Uh, this is a simple example of one fisheye camera. We track all the vehicles in real time and then be able to classify them into different categories like pedestrians, uh, cars, buses, and the likes. Um, this kind of information uh, is essentially then stored in form of tracks. As you can see here, the tracks only keep track of the location for every every frame. Generally, one frame is around one tenth to one twentieth of a second. The other advantage of doing this is that it effectively doesn't store information about the car or uh, or the pedestrian itself, uh, and it obviously addresses key privacy issues which are of interest to us. Um, what we want can then do is once we collect this data, we can do both offline and real time processing. Uh, this shows you all the pedestrian trajectories over a day. This tells us how pedestrians are behaving on the intersection. Generally, the way it's been color coded is that the pedestrians start on the light part and end on the dark part. So it just tells you that there are aberrant uh, behaviors which you want to be able to quantify and at some juncture prevent. Uh, what we have developed, as I was pointing out earlier, is to be able to take multiple data feeds, combine them into one data feed. And this is giving you the combined information if you see my mouse. And generally traffic moves in multiple phases. As you probably know, um, there's north-south uh, traffic, then east-west, then left turn. The traffic engineers think of traffic control in terms of eight phases. So we provide information about what's going on in each of the eight phases by fusing the video information with the signal timing information. Uh, along with the, that, we can, we can also compute things like turn movement counts, gaps, uh, and, and things of that nature, which are of interest. And these are then overlaid on top of the UI itself right here. So this kind of gives you a very good snapshot of what's going on at the intersection. You can, you can then do an offline analysis of all the tracks to find out uh, where the hotspots are uh, or where what kind of traffic is uh, going through that particular network. So for example, on one particular intersection, as you can see, we divide out the traffic patterns into uh, different times of the day and different days of the week. And as you can see that uh, the traffic for this particular thing, because there's a positions of set of offices right here, there's no traffic on the weekends and also there's no traffic in the evening. This kind of macro level analysis can be useful for optimizing signal timing. What our obviously the other goal is to be able to prevent accidents from happening. So in this case, for example, if you if you notice this particular pedestrian uh, right here was walking through uh, this very dense traffic thing. This was a J crossing, and clearly this pedestrian could have been hit by an you know, on, uh, oncoming vehicle. Our goal is to be able to say, hey, can we predict this kind of thing uh, in real time, and at some juncture be able to send this information to the vehicles to prevent the accident from happening. So one of the things which we have been developing is using machine learning and look at trajectory prediction. So red is the tra trajectory which is observed so far, uh, green is uh, what we are predicting, and the blue is the actual one. So till the blue and the green are pretty close to each other, we are doing a good job in terms of prediction. The other important part is obviously the latency of this processing has to be very low. Uh, generally, we can do this in roughly one to two frames. And so our latency is of the order of 0 0.1 second. And now our goal is to be able to then put these algorithms on the edge and then be able to generate messages uh, to vehicles in the future so that they can prevent accidents from happening if they know that there's a pedestrian which is going to cross the intersection. The other thing which we can do is we can do uh, anonymized vehicle trapping. So if there are three cameras at three different intersections, if we can observe the same vehicle and multiple cameras, we know how much time 
this vehicle is taking to go from one intersection to the next on a corridor. And if this gives us a good idea of the congestion on that particular thing, uh, particular corridor. So if you look at this example right here, uh, we are observing vehicles on a particular uh, uh, intersection. Obviously the camera views and the direction uh, and the perspective distortions are different. So our algorithms have to be able to take that into account and, and then using this information now, when the same set of vehicles arrive at the next intersection, then our algorithm tries to match them. Whenever it can get a good match, we get a really good idea of travel time. Our goal is to be able to make sure that the matching is good. In, in, in from a machine learning point of view, we want our precision to be very high. If the if if your coverage is not that high, that's okay because we're just trying to get a travel time distribution, and and our algorithms um, are pretty good. We can get a high precision and with a reasonable recall, uh, so that we can now compute the travel time distribution. And if there's a congestion which happened for a variety of reasons because of an accident, then this system would be able to detect that. The other thing which we uh, want to be able to do then is be able to look at how the travel time or how how, how the near misses are happening at the intersection uh, in terms of whether two vehicles or a vehicle and a pedestrian are coming very close to each other. This is the standard approach which has been used in the literature. And so we can compute all these hotspots for different times of the day. Uh, this kind of shows you a hotspot on, on this intersection are at two different places. Uh, we started analyzing this data to see whether these hotspots are really useful. And we found out that they kind of overcompensate in terms of the number of interactions they count. So we actually have been working on refining that. And we have now been able to develop what we call severe events, uh, like these single trajectory severe events where someone is going the wrong way or changing lanes or, or, or speeding, for example. Um, and so we can count all these very effectively by looking at video processing. Clearly, this cannot be done manually because the number of tracks per day is very, very high. Uh, we all also want to be able to then uh, look at uh, events between pedestrian and vehicles and vehicles and vehicles themselves. So these are the standard safety measures. But because of video processing and our approach to combine that with signal timing, we are able to also get phase information and we can also get whether these phases are compatible or not and whether the velocity of the object was very high or low and whether one of the vehicles actually decelerated. So this kind of information actually can be very useful because then rather than trying to just count near misses, we start looking at near misses which actually are really severe. Uh, and, and so we have a sim which can be used to process these inter interactions and, and we can look at whether a vehicle interaction was conflicting, which may be much more severe than diverging. For example, this guy was taking a U-turn and this guy was following it. Even if there is a, a potential accident, the cost of that accident or the severity of that accident may be lower than one on the left side. So we can start grading these severe events also. Um, and so we've been developing these filters and using that, we actually are able to now get very precise scenarios. So for example, you notice here that this pedestrian is crossing here and, and this vehicle uh, comes very fast. Obviously the, the pedestrian is J crossing because it, it was not there right away. And these are the kind of events in the long term. If we can notify the vehicles, it, they can reduce the number of uh, accidents by a, by a significant amount. But our goal obviously is to not only look at uh, from a real-time prediction, but be able to then count these to understand how safe or unsafe that particular intersection is. Uh, and so we've been working on that uh, for a variety of these scenarios. I'm not going to go over all of these in my time, but basically you can look at that. And then we start looking at different intersections. There are six intersections here where we are able to then do these counts. And this is for one week. And from a large number of uh, near misses, we are able to then reduce it to more like tens and hundreds. Uh, and, and further, the interesting part is after we have the sieve, we actually manually go look at them and find that most of them are actually uh, severe events. 
when visually looked at by a human. So now what that does is that we can, since these events are really interesting or severe, we can start then looking at and say, hey, how much is the, uh, you know, how safe the intersection is by dividing in terms of the amount of traffic. And so now based on this analysis, you can say, hey, these two intersections are much safer than the other ones. Of course, this is just a relative comparison. But not only that, we can actually get information about what kind of events are happening. And this tells us what kind of single timing changes we can make or, or design changes we can make on the intersection to improve safety. So this is something which we are right now working with the city of Gainesville to do before and after studies uh, to understand whether we can actually have a positive impact on safety. The other uh, part of our research is to look at ground sensor data. Um, this is the intersection. And generally there are ground sensors which are at the stop bar and then at the advance for every lane, also for left turns in many cases. And for the side streets, generally they are limited to only stop bars. So if you look at this data, in the old days, these, these systems would provide you data for 15 seconds at a time, just counts. But with the new set of technologies uh, and new software, you can actually get data at a 10 hertz level. And when you look at that data, it looks like a waveform. So our work has been to try to look at this waveform data to be able to then develop uh, digital twins to be able to say, hey, can I actually take a corridor like this and create a digital twin out of that so that if I make any signal timings in the digital twin, then the traffic behavior in the real network will look like what would, what is reflected on the digital twin. The advantage now being that I can try out thousands of scenarios to say, hey, if I want to improve signal timing, say, for example, each of these signals has 10 parameters, then there are 10 to the power of four combinations. Uh, and, and so we can try out all of those in the digital twin for a given traffic uh, for a given hour or for 15 minutes or for a day, and then try to see whether we can actually improve the signal timing. Now, clearly this is a very challenging problem uh, because you need to make sure that the digital twin actually is well calibrated, that the behavior is matching with the real world one, and then be able to uh, also be able to uh, generate uh, you know, feedback loops to say, hey, if I make some changes here and I see, see I, I, I demonstrate in the digital twin that I can get a 5% improvement in travel time by making those changes. If I do make those changes, does the real world actually generate that kind of improvement or slightly lower or it actually makes it even worse? So in some sense, that's a challenge for us to be able to do that. So we've been working on that. Uh, we, one can use simulators for generating these digital twins but they're very, very slow. Uh, generally, one simulation may take 10 seconds to 20 seconds. And if you have to do 10,000 of those, that's not realistic for being able to use in, in real traffic situations. So we would be looking at how do you model these, generate these digital twins using uh, deep neural networks, which are 1,000 to 10,000 times faster than running object-based simulations. Uh, so this is an example of just how do we simulate a real intersection. Our assumption basically is that we're getting streams of data both from the uh, stop bar and the advanced bar at 10 hertz, and we are also getting the signal timing information. Uh, again, this is where, as I was discussing before, the real world is limited because all the data we have is for the current signal timing plans. So if you want to understand what if, when we change the signal timing plan from this to the new one, what will happen? We don't have that data. So we obviously need to use simulators to be able to generate that data. And, and so what we do is we take real streams, put them in simulators, we take real signal timing plans, put them in simulators, and then we modify the signal timing plans. And then we study the dynamics of the intersection and try to model it. So as I was pointing out, the first step of that is to be able to take these detector logs, put them in a, in a simulator. We use Sumo because it's public domain. Uh, and we can parallelize this across tens of thousands of cores. Um, and then we have done that. And we ran around 30 million hours of traffic simulations to generate 50 to 60 terabytes of data, which we then use to be able to 
uh, model our uh, networks and learn from that. So we have developed specialized deep neural networks, which have both uh, phase attention and temporal attention. First goal being, if I give you all the input waveforms, can you predict the output waveforms precisely based on a given signal timing plan? So you can clearly see that we, we are aggregating this information about a five second, 10 second, uh, all the way up to 50 seconds. Remember that trying to do it below this doesn't make sense because the number of vehicles are arriving in five seconds generally is one or two, right? So uh, these results show that we can actually very well predict the output waveforms. Uh, we can actually also uh, learn what was the wait time for different signal timing plans, what was the throughput, what was the travel time through the intersection. Uh, again, we have separate networks for doing that. And, and, and so these again, uh, predict the distribution rather than average or mean because distributions are much more important for us to be able to understand the behavior at that intersection. And, and this is again showing that our system can basically generate the same kind of distribution and as accurately as a simulator can. The bigger advantage of the, of, of, of the twin is that it's roughly 10,000 times faster than a simulator because it's not using object-based simulation and tracking different objects, which are generally a sequential process. In addition, we can actually use GPUs. So these neural networks can are highly parallel and so they can leverage the GPUs too. Combined together, we can actually then use this information to try out different parameters and then say, hey, what's the optimal, uh, within a Pareto curve, what's the optimal area from a traffic engineering point of view? And we provide these charts and let the traffic engineers decide that. So for example, now this thing can actually be used to do hour by hour analysis of, of signal timing for a given intersection. And, and, and our simulation results at least show that this can lead to 10 to 20% improvements uh, in, in wait times. And of course, we are now gonna test these in the, in the field to make sure that our techniques actually work. Um, you can also then say, hey, I, why not I learn a neural network model to look at the, the waveforms on the stop bar and the advanced bar and, and see what the Q lengths are because Q lengths are a very good measure of congestion. And our underlying assumption basically is that when things are congested, the behavior of these waveforms at the advanced and the stop bar are gonna be significantly different than, than when it's not the case. And, and we can show that our neural network models can actually do a pretty good job. Our, error, our errors are of the order of 10%, which is acceptable for most applications. You can obviously do the same thing uh, to look at not only the waveforms at a given intersection, but nearby intersections because the input of one is the output to the other one and vice versa and to be able to see whether you can predict turn movement counts. And we have developed neural networks for that too. Uh, we can detect interruptions by applying machine learning techniques, which uh, again, the key goal here is to be able to generate uh, alarms, but if you generate alarms too frequently and inaccurately, people start, start ignoring them. So our goal has been to be able to be at least 80, 90% accurate whenever we generate the alarm. And also we, we our techniques essentially make sure that we only catch interruptions which are at least 10 minutes or longer because if, if the interruptions are very short, then by the time you uh, predict it and, thinks, and do something about it, for example, uh, the, the traffic interruption is already automatically fixed. Uh, that's all I have to present today. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. You can reach out to me uh, at my email address at sranka at ufl.edu, or you can call me at 352-514. 4213. Thank you very much.